<laughs> that's a good thing. Yeah. Let's see here. Do I, does it look fine? Can you see me? Oh, we yeah. are now on air. Um, so I want to welcome everyone to our discussion, and hopefully somebody will put me up so that you can hear me in addition to being able to see me. Uh, but my name is Jeff Johnson, and I um, have the pleasure of hosting this conversation. Uh, this is going to be a very honest conversation. Uh, it's going to be a very frank conversation. have the great uh, privilege of being with uh, two brothers who are with me. Um, I, I wanted us to be able to have a third, but we do have uh, both Kai and uh, Darnell. Yep. And... Um, just to provide some context, and I think most of you know that on August 1st, 2010, Marissa Alexander, who's from Jacksonville, uh, shot a warning shot at her abusive husband. Uh, she shot at the ceiling. The bullet went through a wall. Nobody was hurt. Um, and her husband had been battering her uh, while she was pregnant. At the time of the incident, uh, she had an injunction out against him. Nine days before that event, she had, been gi she had given birth to a premature baby girl who was fighting for her life. Um, and she invoked her stand your ground as her defense. And as much as many of us think that stand your ground is a bad law, even bad laws should be able to be used the right way um, by the right people. And her defense was rejected. She was convicted and sentenced to 20 years, and she currently is incarcerated. And so this 31 for Marissa is a month-long national campaign throughout this October. And for those of you that don't know, October is um, uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And this is really about engaging men throughout the country to write letters of support uh, in pursuit of Marissa Alexander's freedom and to raise funds for her lawyer fees. Um, this month, uh, we will be engaging in letter writing, notes, um, raising awareness of the injustice of this case, actively engaging in the fight for her freedom, and having discussions like this one uh, that are really emotional justice conversations, conversations that really, especially as men, I think give us the space to be able to talk about things in a way that unfortunately we don't always talk about them. And so many of you know that very often we have conversations through the lens of uh, the woman's responsibility as it relates to domestic violence, what she has done, what she hasn't done, um, what our, our out is, and, and what the loopholes are. But this is really about how do we change the discourse? Um, how do we as men look at ourselves? How do we deal with this through the emotional lens? How do we ensure that we have accountability? And how do we make sure that moving forward, men are able to have these discussions? And so we're excited about you all that have joined us. We hope that you are tweeting. We are going to attempt to follow your tweets. But more importantly, we're going to have a conversation. And so, Kai, I really want to start with you if I can. Um, and you all both understand kind of where we are, where the tone of this conversation should be. And for those of you that, that um, are seeing this picture of this beautiful woman at the bottom of the screen, uh, that is uh, Esther Armar. She is really one of uh, a partner of Brain Trust of Women um, who have been actively engaged in making sure that this movement takes place, not only this conversation. And we are incredibly excited about um, having these sisters be engaged in setting this platform for us. And we'll talk a little bit about them as we, as we go through uh, this conversation. And so Kai, I wanted to start with you and uh, you, like many others, have written a letter already in support, um, have really uh, been transparent, if you will, um, in, in sharing some of you. And I want to read one of your quotes, if I can, uh, to be able to start the discussion. Um, and you say, um, as you, you talk about uh, violence in your own home, and feelings towards mother and father, you say, this was my house. No, this was my mom's house, and I, wouldn't, I would protect her. Triggers. I went downstairs and grabbed the knife. Mom couldn't do it. I thought I could take this man's life. Power. I would take it by force. I stood in the doorway, television glared through the darkness, and I held the knife up so he could see. I hate you. 
I declared. And so there's a lot there. Um, there's a lot there as it relates to what's happening in the house. Um, there's a lot there as it relates to how you're feeling about both your mom and your dad. Um, but as a young man in that moment, um, beyond trying to begin to put yourself in a place to defend, what's the emotion that you're going through at that point? Yeah, so that is, I mean, I think anybody who's experienced any kind of violence, domestic violence as a younger child, oftentimes you feel silent. You oftentimes feel as though you don't have control because really you don't because the people who are supposed to be taking care of you have their own issues that they're dealing with. And so that moment was a real moment for me. I really remember standing in the door watching this. And it, it wasn't a, a physical sort of violent interaction. It was just that my dad had come home. My dad had been addicted to crack and he was on a binge and he came home and he was sort of like taking his place back as the head of household. But a lot of a lot of us um, you know, have to deal with what it means to have some a parent who is sometimes home and sometimes away. And thinking about what it means to be in a a black family where for me my mother was always praying and wanting my dad to take his place as head of household. Um, and so it would be when he came home, you know, he is the head of the household or if he was away at prison and he come back, we'd all have to readjust to this person who hadn't been in that place. And for me a lot of times I was my mother's support and I think a lot of us um, you know, people who, who who live in families like this, young black kids, young poor kids, a lot of times the children play the role of partner to parent, being that emotional support. And a lot of times it's a lot to carry and you don't, people aren't talking to you uh, as if, you know, this is an emotional trauma. This is just every day and your parents are carrying the burden, but I think it's a lot of stress and trauma for children as well. And that's why a lot of the letter that I wrote talks about triggers because this whole sort of memory came back to me after witnessing that very day, the day before Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, a, a domestic dispute in, in my front lawn. Mm. Um, and so then it came back and it put me in that position and I not only witnessed two people fighting violently and physically, but I saw a little girl watching this and what it meant to be that, that little child sort of wanting to help or protect, but then also knowing that you're, you're way smaller than these people. I mean, just physically, you can't. Yeah. And then also, is, is our only option violent? So I went for a knife because that was what I thought would assert some kind of control in that situation. I, I let, looked let me, to violence. Let me ask you, let me ask you this, and, 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 and there's so much there because I, I want to kind of come back to that looking to violence in response to violence. But, but you talked about something that I think is very important, and that was your entire family's kind of perception of head of house, what mm -hmm. it meant for your dad to come home and the role that he played when he came home. And so it, it, that's interesting for me, right, because I, 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 didn't, I didn't grow up in a, dad, in a house where dad was in and out. And so there wasn't a question of the role that dad played, but I, but I got – and, and I've, I'm raising my own kids this way, that head of household is not about asserting authority as much as it is providing comfort and security. And so how, how, does, how does that kind of manifest itself for you, you know, looking at that as a kid and even looking at now as a young man about what it means to be man, what it means to be masculine, what it means to be a man in a household? and what the emotional kind of expression of that manhood is, even during a place of anger and frustration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that I've had to learn that being a man and being, ma being a masculine person, um, it's not about control or power in that way. It's not about... Uh, domination of your, of your household in that way. And really, when we ask people, especially men, to sort of step up, I think it's it's too much pressure. And I don't think I don't think that it's fair. I think that sort of in what, that what's moment not fair? to to ask that 
you know, my father be the man in this way. And that means that he sort of has to handle everything and, and do everything, which he couldn't. And my mother couldn't either. And I think that as, as men, as masculine people, we need to really s start to think about what does it mean to be whole and thinking about you know, what does it mean to be vulnerable? What, it, what does it mean to talk about weakness? What does it mean to talk about it, not in a negative way, but in, in that your strength has vulnerability in it? Um, so I would, I would say that, 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 that there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. So that my, my dad, had an, he had an addiction. So to ask him to sort of take, hold, take the control of the household in this way was already setting you up for failure because you already had all of these things that you were up against you know he's trying to find a job trying to find a job with when you already have a record is hard and then you have mm -hmm. a child and you have a wife who's asking you please you know provide for me and it's like that that's a lot of pressure so but so darnell i mean cuz cuz part, part of what i'm hearing and, and and i'll be honest i mean i'm i'm i am now in a second marriage i have my my children from my first marriage in the home with me um, half the time we split between mom and dad and I know there are times where as the man who is the primary breadwinner who in, in many cases ensures that certain um, structure exists there are times when I know I don't feel like I'm being listened to <laughs> and, hmm. and, and my first um, kind of instinctive thing to do is raise my voice and flex. Hmm. Um, and, and I already know raising my voice and flexing is not necessarily the level of communication that needs to happen for me to show that I'm actually the head of household versus v being able to communicate where I am um, in a firm yet loving way and, and reel that in. But I think for a lot of men, that's challenging. And, and it was interesting, Kai, for me, for you to say that you thought that that was unfair. And so, Darnell, I want to I wanna ask you, at, at what point are we saying that our images of manhood and what it is we're supposed to do, and thus how we interact with women, how we hold our brothers accountable, how we deal with our children, at, at what point is there this line between fair expectations and unfair expectations that we ultimately have to hold ourselves to, not that anybody else is holding us to. So um, to begin, I think first, um, it's unfair for us to live up to this idea of whatever we assume a head of a household is supposed to be, right? So that that's loaded. You know, the moment that I name um, and begin to try to um, perform this thing called head of household is a moment that I began to try to respond to all of the cues and rules that some society has told me as a man I am supposed to enact in a home. Um, and just think about the language. What does it mean to be head? It's already setting up a hierarchy, right? It's already assuming that in a home that there exists this sort of range of power. Yes. Um, and at the top, if we're calling ourselves head, the, in our imagination, the person that maintains the most power in that, in that rhetoric is the man, and that's part of the problem. What if we imagine home space? I, I grew up in a home where the man was ba barely there. So the head of household, or quote, the person that was managing the home, managing the kids, ensuring that food was on the table, ensuring that protection was in order was my mom, right? Mm -hmm. um, what if we imagine uh, you know, communal spaces, home spaces, family, um, where the, the setup is much different. I think black families, we have, the, you know, as much as people have faulted us always and faulted women, specifically black women, for taking quote unquote leadership roles in a home and blaming women for the failures of, of, of not only sort of the black family but black community, we need to reimagine what, you know, how home space ought to exist. And the first thing we can do is to alleviate the burden of trying to be this head. I don't think we're called to be ahead. We're called to be in community. We're called, we're equals, right? And that's part of the first problem. How do we, like, undo, like, all of the boxes that trap us? How do we break those apart? Mm -hmm. um, and I, that, for me, that's part of, I think, the, the way that we can begin to, to heal um, not only ourselves but our relationships, to not right. feel like we've got to box ourselves in. And, and I think that's really important, right, because the, the way that these kind of domestic violence conversations constantly, constantly, constantly start 
is about what we as men don't do. You know, I, I don't, I've never hit anybody. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not that dude. I don't do this. I don't do that. She should not have done this. If she wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't have responded this way. Um, even, even she deserved that, um, which, which in many cases we hear a lot when you, when you talk about aggressive women who are um, expressive and in some way, shape, or form, that expressiveness deserves some kind of response of physicality um, or verbal abuse or any other kind of abuse for that matter. So what, what I'm interested in and where I want us to go I, I like the, what you just said about this redefining piece, but in lieu of that, one of the things that you said was, I was angry because the presence of men like my father who terrorized my mom and the absence of men like my uncles who could have helped her, but most men allow harmful shit to be said about and done to women because it is our default response in a society that perpetuates and allows physical and verbal violence against women. I am not exempt. And so as you talk about that, you know, how are we defining the role that men play in conjunction with our sisters? And I don't mean that from a spouse. I don't mean that from a lover. I mean men and women. Where are we getting it wrong so that we allow ourselves to get in these spaces where an uncle cannot stop it? or a father feels like it's justifiable, or a son begins to internalize it as normal. So part of the reason why I include, like, an I, I start with myself um, as a man, and I think it's easy for us to demonize the folk who are doing overt type of violence, you know, the person who can show up and physically abuse a woman, and we can say that's a bad man, um, the folk who are using sort of like harmful language, um, and not often think about our own complicity in in, our, in oppression, right, and sexism, misogynistic oppression. So the moment that I, I use the example, I go down and say, like, when I'm sitting in a barbershop and I overhear conversations, and men flexing, um, talking about the, the many girls that they slept with, the many women that they have uh, done things to, um, and the moment that I stay silent, right, is also the moment that I, too, am complicit in an oppression, oppressive system against women. Um, the moment that I, I start jamming on my, on my earphones on the subway to some music where... Um, sisters are being um, assailed and, and disrespected by the language is also the moment that I show up just... So I guess for me, I think there's a way clearly we, we sort of separate the bad guys, you know, the guys mm -hmm. that like are in jail because, you know, my dad got locked up for what he did to my mom and that, you know, somehow I can turn him into the enemy and then look at myself as some better type of black man because I didn't do the work of physically abusing somebody. But it, the, the punch is an after effect of a thought. Like the thought starts first. The thought is going to, whatever that thing is in your head that's telling you this woman is less than, mm -hmm. is going to result in you hitting her or doing some other type of abuse. So what I'm trying to get at, I think part of the way that, that we can all be better um, is by turning the mirror back on ourselves and saying, okay, while I may not be the person that's physically abusing a woman, right? In what ways am I complicit in holding that structure up? So yeah. I talk about my uncles like not showing up. Um, even if they, you know, didn't show up to sort of jump in the midst of the fight and to break it up, right? Even if they are still, um, you know, treating the women in their lives wrong, not just their, their, their women friends, you know, their girlfriends, but their sisters. <laughs> you know, like, you know, I have three younger sisters. You know, how am I showing up um, in a way that's treating them equitably, in a way that's treating them with respect? What about the stranger on the street, the woman who I have no connection to? Um, and how am I showing up in a way that advances pure humanity and lifts up pure humanity? So I think um, I'm so interested in us, like, as men, moving and interrogating our own sexisms, specifically the ones that, that we don't want, you know, get called out on because we're not doing the things that all the bad guys are out there doing. No, and that's real. And, and I'm, I'm, I saw that we had someone join us, but it's hard for me to see your face. Is that Jason? Are you there? Somebody's uh, there. Somebody's there. It's the, the phantom guest. Um, <laughs> if, if, if their audio is on and, and they can hear us, uh, please just chime in so I can bring you into the discussion. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'll be honest, man. I mean, I, when, when I think about where we are and, and I think about at, at 40 years old, you know, my own trajectory with women, um, 
I've never necessarily been that dude that was violence against women, but I do remember being in a space where I felt like women were there to serve me hmm. more than I was there to be able to appreciate who she was disconnected from me. And so even our inherent kind of processing of what the value of women is puts us in a place where we're able to justify some of the bullshit that we do. And so most of the guys I know don't like women. Hmm. They want to possess them. Sure. And, and so I'm not viewing her through the lens of um, how, how wonderful is she without me? How wonderful mm -hmm. is she without looking great showing up on my arm? How great is she without cooking my dinner? How good is she without being in the house holding me down because I can't hold myself down? You know, how wonderful is she all by herself, disconnected from me or any other man, mm -hmm. and, and then being able to create relationship based on that value? And so I know I've had the most difficult time creating conversation with my boys around even changing how we talk about women through the lens of that value proposition, which, which is four and five steps before it ever gets physical, four or five steps before I ever start shouting, right? It's, it's, it's in that root, how do I see this woman and her value um, mm -hmm. disconnected from me? And, and, and Kai, so I want you to chime in a little bit on um, this value proposition and, and, and yeah. how that affects, go, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I think that, thank you guys both so much for this discussion, it's really fruitful. Um, I think something that I really want to bring through to this discussion is we're, we're really talking about the relationship between men and women and sort of this um, this power this power dynamic where men always are in control or in power, but I really want to actually push us to think about the relationship between masculinity and femininity because mm. I, I feel that masculinity is the thing that is we only understand it in in relationship to a sort of debasement of femininity which means these dynamics this sort of violence this domestic violence that you see is not only it only it doesn't just happen between men and women it happens between women and women it happens mm -hmm. between men and men it happens between all kinds of people but I think at the root of it a lot of times it is this question of masculinity as violent as dominating as as something that is only able to express itself as like I only understand myself by what I can sort of debase or and that is that is the feminine and I think that mm -hmm. whether or not we love women or not I think there's something that we all have been learned to dislike femininity even if it's the femininity that's within ourselves as men um, we've been we've been taught sure. that that's something to hate and sort of pound out and and so how do we begin to deal with that? Because because you're right. I mean, and, and that takes it to a, a, a much more human level um, and, and removes some of the social foolishness in, in trying to figure that out. So how do we begin to address that more effectively? Well, I think one of it, some of it is about really talking honestly about what we've experienced and, and the beauty of femininity and the, the femininity that we love. And it's sort of embracing that. You know, femininity isn't just weakness. It isn't just uh, all, all these opposite things. And we know this firsthand. Like, we've seen examples of it in our lives. We've seen our mothers love us. We've seen our mothers be strong. We've seen, we've seen all this. We've seen our fathers. I've seen my father. I've seen my uncles be weak and vulnerable. And for me, that didn't make them less of a man or it didn't take away from their masculinity. And so if we could sort of, as black people especially, we are, our understandings of masculinity and femininity have always been different from sort of the dominant notions. And if we could sort of not fear that, not fear that difference and embrace it as actually we have a different way of relating to each other where we don't have to... Um, we we don't have to set it up in this violent way. I think it's sort of reclaiming and remaking masculinity, black masculinity and, and black femininities, right? Um, and I just want to... Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, I wanted to chime in and just thank Kai for bringing that up um, because I also think about even same-sex relationships with men, right? The issue is gender. So, like, you know, in relationships between men, two men, for example, like there's this notion of, like, the top and the bottom. Like, that language is just so loaded, right? So top and bottom, 
um, you know, aggressive, passive, which equals sort of this notion of masculine, feminine. There's always a sort of hierarchy where the top, the aggressive, <laughs> the masculine partner, um, however they're, you know, experience themselves um, in the world through their gender, is always seen to have more power. Part of the issue is, like, we are so committed to boxes. You know, mm -hmm. we're so committed. Boxes make us feel safe. Um, you know, and, and at least they make the, the, those outside of us feel safe. So the moment that I can sort of claim an identity and live into that box is a moment that we feel safe. But I think we need to be, you know, it sounds so cliche, but thinking outside the box, like living um, and breaking the boxes because they so easily can constrict us um, and cause us to be violent. So what will make, you know, when you think about something like, you know, homophobia, which really... I think people react to sort of men who appear feminine not because they think they're sleeping with another man, it's because they're expressing like a feminine gender expression, right? So anytime we sort of deviate from the boxes is when problems start. And I think that's part of our freedom. Um, part of our freedom is should, we should be providing the space to deviate from boxes that do not help us in the first place. Absolutely. They don't help us. Absolutely. Um, because, because at the end of the day, no matter how you begin to attack that, it's all a box. Right. Um, because I, I, I even have a problem when you start saying masculine traits versus feminine traits. Right. Um, because that implies that innately as a man, I'm not supposed to be sensitive. Sure. That, that's that feminine side of me coming out. When me, me kissing and hugging my boys is as much a part of my masculinity as anything else. But, but even the moment I say that out of my mouth, Mm -hmm. it, it, it begins to it begins to alienate somebody else or or create this this box and so I really I really agree with you I think that that having these kind of conversations differently Kai I'm very thankful that you brought that up as well um, but but let's focus this a little bit um, because I want I want to talk a little bit about how we as men begin to change the environment that we as men are in and and whether you are gay straight or whatever there is a almost like this um, almost like the police this blue shield of silence around violence that takes place oftentimes in our community and so you know part of the man code is not to get involved in right. somebody's stuff um, and so part of this is is and, and Kai it still goes back to what you said too dealing with this masculine feminine piece it goes back to the conversation around homosexuality heterosexuality because this 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 is not this doesn't fit in those boxes this is about how do we as men talk about violence and where is a level of account when does accountability become normal as opposed to going against what's normal and 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 have you all experienced it um, in your own circle, and what what did that look like? Yeah, I was going to say that it's um, you know part of the first thing that comes to mind is what do we do when we see, um, you know, particularly women, and I I think I'm we're focusing on women specifically because while you know violence, intimate partner violence occurs in a range of relationships, there is something very specific about. Yes the type of violence enacted upon um, a women identified people, right? yes. like women's bodies, by those who identify themselves as men, and I want to attend to that. Um, but it's been my case that most of the time what I've come at is like, you know, you know, there's this fear. Like, you know, I remember being at a train stop and watching this brother attack this woman. And, um, you know, one, it often just stops me in my tracks because of all that I've experienced as a young child growing up watching my mom being abused in my home, it often just stops me before I do anything else. And my first fear was, if I get into this, there's a possibility I'm going to get into a fight. Right. And somehow, you know, we are so committed as men, quote unquote, right, as the masculine, to want to wanna be so powerful all the time. I have to acknowledge that sometimes I'm just scared as hell. I'm scared of confrontation. I'm scared that if I get into something, you know, something, you know, a situation, something might happen to me. And in that moment, I decided to stand up and that when I took a stand, other brothers joined in. And it could have been violent, you know what I mean? And so that's always a possibility. Um, and the second thing is, too, somehow we've learned, like, that some of these issues, and I think about my own family life, is like, that's not our business. Like, you know, you, that's sort of not... Um, something that we're so that's their business. Mm -hmm. No, it is our business. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anytime a human being is violated, victimized, it is our business. 
um, because we are also therefore responsible, right? If I allow someone to be abused in front of my face, I am actually partaking in that abuse by um, keeping myself from either um, assisting, calling the police, or helping. Any moment I turn away and not help is a moment that I've aided in, a, in, the, in the, abuse, an abuse of somebody else. So I think men should also, I think we also should give, our, like, give ourselves a space to say things like, you know, I'm actually scared to jump in. I'm scared mm -hmm. if I stop my boy, my boy going to think I'm a punk. I'm scared he might turn around and hit me. I'm actually scared. Um, or two, I just don't know what to do. Um, are getting rid of this idea that somehow what happens in somebody else's house don't have nothing to do with me. That's not how we roll in my family. Whatever happens in somebody else's house, but you know, it's our business too, and we want to, yeah. you know. Kai, Kai, Kai yeah. how do we how do we fight that fear? Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I have I have experience in in my family where a cousin will say, um, who was 18 years old, getting ready to go to college, spent the vast majority of her senior year fighting her boyfriend. Um, and I mean, they were viciously attacking each other. And my first inclination without question was to get on a plane and go handle it, whatever handle it meant, right? W was confront this kid. I had already talked to him about it and, and tried to play a mentorship role to just say, look, this is what, this is, this is not what we do. And so I, I felt like I had created a sense of accountability, tried to provide him with some options, said he needed some help to deal with some of his anger issues, that none of this was going to solve what it was that he was dealing with. But at the same time, I had a friend who was in a marriage situation, and I thought twice about having the conversation with him. And so, you know, how do we begin to even remove this double standard of what women we protect and which women we don't mm -hmm. versus getting back to your earlier point that it just can't go down like that no matter what happens because th there's internal judgment issues we have and and, and 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 you know my story is an example of it but but how do we get to that place where we confront the fear of it not it, it, at some point it's so intuitive that this is part of what we need to do as men that we just deal with the fear first and attack that versus the judgment of does this woman deserve it versus this little girl or what did she do versus mm -hmm. this baby who I know didn't do anything. And, and I, I know as, as, as brothers in my circle, we do that. We, we want to mm -hmm. defend. We, we say we want to defend women, but there's certain women we defend while mm -hmm. others, we just let them deal with it. Right. And I, I think that that is a very important point because I think that, you know, no one, no matter if you are a streetwalker, if you are at, at a business somewhere, wherever you are, nobody deserves to be hurt. Nobody de deserves to be physically abused. It's just not okay. Now, when thinking about the what the fear that Darnell was speaking on, sort of what do you do when you're in that moment and you're witnessing, like physically witnessing someone hit someone else. That's what happened to me the other day. I, I saw this woman's face bloody. And, and that, that does something to you because you, you're thinking, uh, could that be me? And then who do you call? And that's the question for me. Who do you call? Because I don't want to call the police in South Central LA because I know that the police really aren't going to make the situation better. Um, it'll be worse. And so for me, the question is, okay, so what does justice look like? What is, what is how do we how do we deal with this as a community once we stop the initial violence? For me, it has been, and there have been three moments in my sort of adult life where I've had to step in, and that has meant sort of a lot of times it's just saying, "Hey, I see you. Hey, y'all need to stop." And people, because they feel like if you don't say anything, people are like, "Well, nobody sees me, nobody cares. I can do whatever I want." And there have been plenty of times where it's like there are other people around witnessing this but nobody's going to say anything so you have to be that person you actually have to go beyond that fear but I think another well, but, another but, important but, but, thing that you, you go talked there, about and, is, and I want you to is, come back to that because I, I want you to I, I want to deal with one of the letters that we saw that that talks about that um, and kind of what happens when we don't speak up um, so this is a brother who lost his sister to suicide she was in a marriage with domestic violence um, and his letter really deals with kind of the guilt and deflection and the silence and the blame. He says, had I spoken up, 
I would have asked him how he how he would feel if if he suspected that his own sister felt imprisoned by some man or reminded him that the pain he inflicted on my sister would end easily if we sent him back home to languish in the streets he escaped. I would have asked him what definition of love he believes in because his frequent proclamations of love for my sister were contradicted by his violence. And so I think that's really important, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, we, I, I talked a little bit about how we view women differently. We view men in these situations differently. So right. if, if, if there's a brother who is blatantly, overtly evil, as we see it, based on how he talks, how he walks, what his history is, you know, we may deal with it one way, but when there's a brother who's constantly proclaiming some emotional feeling that is disconnected from his action, we give them a pass and a lot of times let brothers back in spaces to be able to afflict harm when we should be cutting that off immediately and saying, I don't care what you say, this is what you're doing. And, and, and so, Kai, I want you to deal with, and Darnell, chime in on this, how do we then begin to go beyond accountability and bringing it up to actually getting ourselves or other brothers help? Well, th this is the thing that you mentioned before that I think is so important, is that, that, that there are no purely evil people in my mind. There's nobody who's just, that's a bad man. That's a person who may be hurt. That's a person who doesn't know how to deal with his emotions. That's a person who needs help. Now, you can't say, okay, this person needs help, so I'm going to give them a pass, and what they do has no consequences. No, but it is that, okay, we ended this situation right now, this immediate violent situation, but brother, let me talk to you. Let me be your friend. I'm not going to desert you and leave you and be like, well, I'm not going to talk to that guy because he's violent, he's messed up. It's actually, how do we actually embrace you? And that, to me, is a different way of thinking about justice that's not punitive, right? It's like, actually, we're, we're going to talk about rehabilitation. We're going to talk about holistic healing. We're going to go deep right now. We're going to maybe need some somatic training. We're going to, because it's necessary. Otherwise, Otherwise, why not the prison industrial complex if we're not going to actually go in and, and deal with people's issues? Because that's what prison is. It's just throwing people away and not sitting, not, not dealing with, you know, this person has been hurt and now they don't know how to, how to deal with, with, with relationships or building communities. So I think that not leaving people or deserting people or putting people out as this is a bad person, that's what we have to, we have to grapple with. I wanted to um, return to, to get to your point. I want to return to something, though, and that's this point about, like, sort of which woman deserves it or, what, you know, what did this woman do um, as opposed to, you know, young sister over here um, and the way we sort of, like, selectively intervene. Um, and it's sort of, you know, it's those type of selective interventions are laced with so many type of judgments, right? Um, it almost is the same thing that undergirds our responses to rape. Um, you know, this question of, well, what did person X do in order to get, there is never an excuse, <laughs> um, regardless of what one does, right, for the type of responses that can be enacted upon their body, the type of violences. So I think making that clear first, right, um, regardless of if, if, you know, my mom came home and she got, you know, she said whatever to my father, if she cussed, if she threw something, there is no reason, there is never any reason, right, for a man, for anyone, for any partner to respond by virtue of violence upon that person's body in the same way there's no excuse, there's no excuse for rape. So I wanted to make sure that we say that. You know, I think we need to say that. Secondly, but, how, but, 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 and stay there for a second. How, how do we deal with that, though? Because I think I hear us say that all the time. I mean, we, in, in the hood, you hear cats talk about men don't hit women. In, in, in the suburbs, you hear people say men don't hit women. And, and that it is not a, a acceptable response. But th there really are two emotions, right? There's love and there's fear. And I, I don't know who's popping you off. Um, but th there's, there's love and there's fear. And, and I want us to deal with the fact that most of the time that brothers, even those that quote unquote know better, begin to respond that way, it's out of fear. It's out of insecurity that I'm not the man that I think I am. I'm, she is expressing to me that I'm not the man that I want her to think I am. I'm afraid of rejection. I'm afraid of being weaker than her. And so this fear that I have, 
not just about th that, that fear that Kai talked about uh, and, and that you talked about of stepping in when it's time to step in, the fear that I'm not enough. The fear right. that you don't fit the, that you don't match, that you don't fit the box that somehow you're not you know responding to to this idea of what a man is supposed to be, like those and, are. But but how but how how do we help that right because yeah. it's it, it's one thing to say this is not acceptable, but I'm dealing with some real shit, man. I mean, if I could feel better about myself, I would feel better about myself. But telling me not to take it out on this woman when she's the closest person to me, so damn it. When I get home, ain't nobody else there. And we all know that so many women are dealing with the, the, the byproduct of, of our fear and our insecurity because they're the closest ones to us. And, and that doesn't change until we get help, we begin to go through transformation, we begin to deal with that healing that Kai talked about. How do we begin that? How have you all seen um, cats begin or you all begin to deal with that healing process, even from some of the things you saw happen in your own house. Sure, I, I think you know that's. I'm, I'm, I appreciate this um, this particular point. Um, one, because what you said is really important. That the problem is really not the you know the the perp the victims issue. <laughs> it's the perpetrators, right? It's off. It's not the victim. It's not the person being. You know, it's, it's not my mom um, coming in and my dad. You know is somehow she's supposed to now become a punching bag because he can't deal with the fact that he can't live up to some fake ass standard that somebody set up for him to live in in the first place. That's right. not her fault. That doesn't that is that does not allow him the, the give him reason to walk by and say something like I'm going to kill her and then try or the brother that's watching him do it because somehow he's being redeemed. His manhood is being redeemed by watching this other man beat on a woman. That's not her fault. Right at all. That's not women's fault. That's no one's. It is our responsibility. Um, and at, you know this self-reflective, you know, sort of, you know, fancy term is like self-reflective analysis. Being able to look in a mirror in our in our own reflections and seeing our shit, seeing our issues, right, without making women one responsible for, um, you know, if we fail to live up to some standards, so we abuse them, or responsible for healing us. We got to heal ourselves. You know, and so long we wait for others to come heal us, or if they can't do that work for us, make us feel good through sex, make us feel good through serving us, we then think we can go ahead and abuse them. That's our job to heal ourselves, you know? And that work for me means that I have to, regardless of what type of relationship constellation I'm in, if it's intimate or not, to check myself and to come, like, to come clean. And this is hard work, right? To one, to make this sort of, to, to, to state, you know, I have tried to live up to the standard of black manhood or masculinity um, that somebody else has given me. I've tried to, to, to live into that. I've failed. Um, and these are the ways in which, you know, I have, I have worked at that and I've, like, coming clean with all of my stuff, coming clean with the ways that I have also been complicit in these forms of oppression, coming clean in the ways that I have had damaging views of women and men, and sitting, and that came, like, because of community. One, I didn't just wake up one day and was able to just get this idea that somehow I needed to begin to work on myself. It came from being in relationship with men who, straight, gay, whatever, who had themselves journeyed down that pro um, along that process. You know, sitting with men who, would, like my grandfather. My grandfather didn't have anything. You know, he wasn't as rich. He, didn't, he was still living in the same hood as my black dad. But here was a man that taught me something different. So I had to search out um, brothers who represented something different than, yes. the, the, than the negative masculinity that I was given. Yes. Um, and, and, and I was in a similar space. Um, I, I, man, when I was national youth director, I was national youth director of the NAACP and was supposed to be in this space where I was surrounded by these incredibly virtuous brothers who, you know, wanted to see the country change and wanted to use civil rights to be able to do it. And I was a horrible husband and was surrounded by brothers that were horrible husbands hmm. and had created this fraternity of bullshit. Right. Where we we put ourselves up at because of our jobs as these noble men who were serving communities. But we were cheating on our wives, abusing our wives, not there for our children um, and, and justifying it in the name of the movement, which is total bullshit. Right. right. But 
but what happens so often is if we're doing good things in one area, we will justify sure. our shit in another area. Absolutely. And, and so I, I, I wanted to make sure we kind of dealt with that because I think you answered it right. It wasn't until, one, I started sharing my expectation of the kind of man that I wanted to be with the brothers that were around me. Right. So so what what happens so often is that I don't think we share expectations with the men around us of the kind of men we want to be. Mm -hmm. And so we allow each other to exist in these boxes because we all feel like the boxes are where we all say we want to be. But not until you say to your boys, I want to step out because because it's not enough to say to yourself, not until I say to my boys, I want to step out of this box, not until I say. Uh, I want you to hold me accountable when I step outside of this box and then begin to identify brothers who have stepped out of that and created the kind of relationships, period, not just with women, but with women in general, that I can model. Mm -hmm. Because if, if we're doing a straw poll, it's two out of three on, on, in this conversation who didn't have a consistent dad. Um, and, and we all know that that is the general consensus. So, so I, I think that there's a couple of things. A, a, as we start that healing process, we, one, have to acknowledge it ourselves, but we, we need a core group, man, that, that is ride or die accountability that says we all want to be in this space. And so we ultimately become a fraternity of accountability. Because mm -hmm. until, until that, we don't have healthy spaces that even give us the comfort to be transparent and heal. I just mm -hmm. wanted to say um, quickly, too, I'm, Kai, I'm interested in your thoughts on this. Um, you know, when I think about who I am today in the world, most of the traits that I embody are things that I watched my mom in, inhabit. Like, my mom was the first <laughs> one man who taught me how to be human. She taught me what it meant to care about people in my life who were in need. She taught me what it meant to be there when nobody else would be there in the lives of my family members. And, you know, it's often the case, you know, we get this thing where it's like you need, men can only teach men how to be men. Well, one, if I understand masculinity and femininity to be constructions anyway, which tells me that it doesn't necessarily mean that, a, a, you know, a similarly uh, gendered-bodied individual need to teach me anything. My mama really taught me how to be human. My mama taught me how to be loving. Um, my mama taught me, you know, even I watched the pitfalls and the ups and the risings and, the, you know, the failures of her relationships and learned how to come clean when I was messed up, when I, when I messed things up, and to love. Um, but then I was also blessed to have men in my life, too, um, who were models of something very, very different. I think, and I say this often, and this has been coming up a lot, like, what would it mean for us to, beyond asking what it means to be a good man, to ask the question, what does it mean to be human in this moment? Mm -hmm. You know, because I think that uh, the first question yeah. gets tripped up a bit. No, 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 absolutely. Ch Kai, chime in. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about what you're saying, Darnell, and I think it's true that for a lot of us, we, we, uh, the, the notion that, you know, black men are, our families are messed up because our mothers raised us and now we don't know how to be men. I, I think that's absolutely a lie and a farce and it's it's not something that it's something that we really need to push back against but I also think there's something that we need to do in terms of building community, building ourselves as, as better men when we mentor other men is to allow them to understand that they can learn things from women. They can learn how to respect women because a lot of times we're saying we need to be better men so we can teach other men. But if you're saying, Darnell, that it's your mother who taught you how to be human, it's your mother who taught you how to love, well, how do we teach these young boys how to respect women in places of authority so that they can be sure. open to learning how to be better men and not not disrespect, not be disrespectful, but just like take that gift and not say, well, I lack something because I there's, there's not a man teaching me this, but no, this is amazing because a woman is teaching me this, and it's important for me as a man to learn this. Um, I, I really do think that something that's been amazing and essential in my life as a trans, as a black transgender man, has been the uh, the Brown Boy Project, which is a, a, a organization that is about thinking about how do we change and shift masculinities of color? How do we think about it not as 
hyper masculine, hyper violent. How do we think about the ways in which bio, uh, masculinity sort of affects the way we're all, all able to walk in this world? And sometimes, as men of color, as black men especially, it's it, we are seen as violent aggressors. And how do we? But we know something different. We know that that's not all that we are, right? Mm -hmm. And so, how do we begin to really uh, take that in and understand that that's that's not who we are. We are love. We are human. We are actually more than gender. We are more than men and women, masculinity and femininity. How do we begin to sort of teach ourselves that, but not only teach ourselves that, but walk in affirmation of that knowing of our humanness, right? Walk with knowing that just because I'm not the man that you told me I should be, that I'm not a man. No, this is something different. This is a dream of something new, and I'm manifesting it right now with my life as the example. Um, yes. No, and I, I think that's fantastic. I, yes. I, I was ho I was hoping that we would begin to get more questions than comments from Twitter, but I think I think there there's a blessing in that. There is a rich conversation, and, fo and folks are enjoying the conversation more than feeling the need to ask questions. Um, but but kind of go back to to your last point and and uh, to to really I think kind of build on and I, and I was gonna I was gonna read another quote but Darnell I'm really interested in where both of you are going with this humanity piece and how challenging that is for us sometimes um, and and even as I think about this conversation around emotional justice. Um, you know, this conversation is frankly a byproduct of the Chicago Task Force on Violence Against Girls and Women and the emotion and emotional justice unplugged, both sisters, right? Sisters who have brought this conversation together. And I'll be honest, I, as long as I've been on the circuit and as many times as I've traveled, very seldom have I seen brothers put together this kind of conversation. And so how have can you talk a little bit about how either of you personally have had to deal with embracing your own humanity, mm. what that meant as it related to who you were as a man, and how that challenged, morphed, um, or created some revelation around women in particular and violence? Yeah, I, um, I often say, particularly for those of us who have had to fight so you know in the history to proclaim our humanity when we've been called <laughs> everything but that's a radical act for the black um, for the, for those persons in this country who um, were not even given humanity um, as a as a way of of, of um, identifying ourselves um, so that we have sought so hard to try to become men and women and all these other things uh, masculine and feminine. Um, in a society that told us we were never human, um, tells me that it is a radical act to return to that question of what it means to be human in this moment. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, for someone who um, felt that the boxes that had been given to me were so restrictive um, and just small, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, I needed to figure out who I was in the world, like who I am as a being. Um, what essences and aspects of, of you know my mom, the things that I wanted to sort of model, what aspects and essences of my father when he didn't show up uh, abusive, but of my sisters, like, and I've come to embrace my masculine and my feminine, my all of that, um, all of those things, the energies that exist within me, and I'm comfortable. I've learned to be comfortable in my skin. I've learned to be, and that is. You know, as easy as it is to say now, that took a lot of years of practice. It took a lot of years for me, a black boy growing up in the hood who had a very particular way, um, I was told a very particular thing about what it meant to be black um, and man growing up in Camden, New Jersey, to get to a point at 37 where I could just love who I see in a mirror. And a lot of us don't. A lot of us do not love the person, that the, the reflection that's looking back at us in the mirror because we're told that that reflection does not perfectly image uh, what everybody else expects um, for us to be. But if we can somehow learn to do that um, in a society that teaches us th that loving ourselves is not a possibility, then that, that's first, that's part of it. But secondly, I, I do try to surround myself um, with individuals who are also in that same quest. Um, so we, do, we write together as part of this Brothers 
writing to live campaign, black men writing to live campaign, where folks there are brothers um, I, who are variously identified across a range of, of identities, where you know whose ge geographies are different, economic statuses, life worlds, and together we struggle with um, not only trying to uncover sort of the problems that we've that we've come across that are the same, but we try to struggle together to figure out new ways of being in the world and supporting each other to be differently in the world and to, to say to somebody, you know, when I come across like young black men, young black boys, the first thing I say is, you know, free yourself mm -hmm. from all of the undue expectations that are placed upon you to be somebody that you know damn well you're not. Be bold enough to be who you are. That's the radical act. Mm -hmm. um, to sort of, to say to break up, you know, to say, you know, I'm rejecting what you're giving me. I'm actually going to reject that box because that's not who I am. Um, and to live into those those ways of being that we understand ourselves to be. That is hard work, and it doesn't happen overnight. Every day I got to get up, you know, despite white racial supremacy, despite homophobia, despite all of these other things, these other pressures that we got to work through, and become the person that I know myself to be in spite of all those things. And there is no reason, because I have to walk, work through all of that, to take that shit out on somebody else. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, and, and, and that is... I, I, I don't. I don't know if we get better closing remarks than that. Um, just, just kind of as we as we're summing this up and beginning to transition. Kai, I want to kind of get you to provide some closing thoughts and 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 in the same direction, um, how you personally dealt with this humanity piece and how that affected this notion of violence towards women. And and then, if if you could go there for me. Yeah, you know, I think, Darnell, thank you so much. Like, I needed to hear your words today especially. I think for me, the the work of becoming human and, and understand it, it's not about looking for something. It's about knowing that everything I already, everything I need, I already have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, are, we are seeking, for me as someone who grew up poor, in East Oakland, went to private school, and I had never understood that people were, I didn't know what rich was until I entered this space of white people who, who, told, who told me I was different, who told me I spoke different, who, told, who showed me that, you know, this is what class is and this is what you don't have because you live in East Oakland, a place that we're afraid to go, right? So there was a lot of things that I never knew to be ashamed about until I entered these other spaces. And so for me, growing up and being in like really elite uh, educational institutions has been, you know, a privilege, but then also a lot of, I have to heal from the trauma of going through this, going through systems that tell me, we want you, we like you, but everything that you come with, everywhere that you come from, we don't value that. And so for me, it's been like I have to revalue and reclaim my blackness, my home, where I come from, and understand that that is a beautiful place. It's a place of love. It's where I learned how to love, so I can't let that go. And I think that a lot of times when we're in these in these spaces where you, we are all in these kind of elite institution spaces and have, have this presence um, and have these platforms, I think a lot of times we don't, we don't consider how much a gift we are. Mm -hmm. We just are, and we are we are blessed with that gift, and we need to value that. And it's hard because people don't tell you. They teach you shame. They teach you to be ashamed of these things. And so I'm really interested right now in my life in saying, no, I love everything that I am, every queer bit of myself, every black bit of myself. I love it. And that is not something that anybody can teach you um, in, in these institutions, right? This is something that you learn from your mother. This is something you learn from your family because they see you and they see themselves in you. And I think that we have to be those kinds of reflections of a affirmation, just like you are alive. And when you forget, I'm going to remind you because you're my brother. You are alive, and I love you. So I'll just say that. Wow. Um, Kai, you made me think about something, and the, this human piece and, and the process that we've all gone through. And and even what you just talked about, Kai, it 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 it, it even made me think about. And as strange as this is going to sound, and I'm not attempting to bring this up because it's trending, 
but but when I'm watching Kanye last night and I'm looking at this this com what I think is a complex person because I know him um, and and how we navigate the hatred of the world um, the condemnation of the world the low self-esteem we have juxtaposed with the brilliance we know is inside of us and and how even what we produce becomes schizophrenic because we simultaneously are dealing with self-hate in the midst of the acknowledgement of incredible brilliance and as men the thing that's so often missing is not the ability to fight off those that institutional racism kind of stuff and, and all of this shit that is coming on us. And as a result, when we get home, we don't know how to stop fighting. It, it's not so much that swag that we have, because even as we wear the mask, as Paul Lawrence Dunbar wrote, we acknowledge that I'm better than so many people at what I love to do. And I know and have a sense of purpose that I've been put here for this. But sometimes, you know, the one thing that's missing with us is the love of other men. Sure. And and it's and it's not about um, sexual orientation and it, it, it's about as men have we put a value on loving other men. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who told me maybe four or five years ago, and and we were thirty five at the time, that I was the first man that ever told him he loved him, mm -hmm. and he didn't know how to take it when I said it. So he's like, wait, I know Jeff. I feel like I know his sexuality. And then in this typical kind of homophobic black man masculinity confusion shit, I didn't say no homo. So he was confused about you know, where I was really coming from. Sure. And, and, and there's so many men that have never been able to be sensitive and, and transparent with women because they've never been able to do it with men. And so even as we talk about this being free to be human within our own selves and this whole notion of being accountable to each other, we got to love each other. Sure. We got to love the men in our life hard and, and not be so damn confused about those boxes, Darnell, that we got to qualify what the hell it means when we say it mm -hmm. um, or, or have to put it in a box to make you feel like I can't say I love you without saying no homo or without dealing with some other preconceived nonsense. And, and then we got to really show it um, and, and start being comfortable, being transparently sensitive and simultaneously masculine mm -hmm. with the men in our lives. And, and I know that I am a better father because I had a father who loved me, mm -hmm. not loved me in word. I took care of him. I made sure that he was provided for. I remember what my dad's beard feels like against my face because up until the time that he died in May, he hugged me and kissed me. You know what I mean? And and, and I, I think about these young brothers that I interact with on college campus um, and in our community and, and they are looking for the love of men. That's what gangs are about. That's what that's what the, these conclaves are about that are often incredibly negative because they're hyper masculine in the worst ways, but they are actually these places where it's the only love I know how to get. And, and if we as men would really be able to say, I love you every single day and how we talk to each other and how we, how we engage each other um, and allow that to be a springboard to go out into the world, and, and be able to stop fighting in places that we don't have to fight and being able to love in places that we can love, how we treat our women, the kind of ways that we engage them, the things that we would allow to happen to them, and how we treat each other in the midst of that would begin to change in a miraculous way. Um, I, I want to say a, um, a huge and humble thanks to um, the Chicago Task Force on Violence Against Girls and Women um, and uh, Sister Kaba and Emotional Justice, uh, Emotional Justice Unplug and, and Esther Ama, um, and and those that are part of Free Free Marissa now uh, for bringing us together. Sure. Um, I really hope we can do this again. Yep. Um, and I would I would really love to engage some younger brothers 
um, some high school or college age brothers. And, and, and Esther, I know you're listening, so I'm, I'm willing to be led by you anywhere you're willing to lead us. Um, but I would love, I, I have been so blessed by you brothers. Um, and, and, and I've learned a lot um, about myself even listening to you. And so I, I want to, as we say thank you to our hosts, um, I want to say thank you for you all for your, your um, transparency, your honesty, your openness, your sensitivity, uh, and your willingness to go so often where we won't go. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you for having us. And for all of you that are listening, um, thanks so much for being a part of this discussion. Uh, there's so much more work we need to do. Please continue to be engaged with um, 31 for Marissa because uh, this is not over until she's free. And uh, if we don't take that seriously, we'll forget that 31 days is just an opportunity, but this movement is an imperative. Uh, so God bless you all. And, and Esther, I don't know if you want to have the last word. Yeah, hi there. I just put my... I just put my camera on. Thank you so much to um, Jeff Johnson and uh, Kai Green and Donnell. Thank you so much, brothers. So as Jeff explained, this is one of many conversations that we are creating. It's hashtag 31 for Marissa. This is a campaign that is led by the Chicago Task Force on Violence Against Girls and Women. I'm Maria Macaba, Emotional Justice Unplugged, and myself, and Free Marissa Now. And it is about engaging men actively in conversations around domestic violence, which means conversations about masculinity and love and reflection and blame and shame and all of those other things. I don't know what that crackling is, but it's driving me crazy. Um, for all the live tweeting, thank you so much. If you have listened to this, have been moved by this, you can contribute to this conversation. We're asking a nation of men, black, white, red, yellow, brown, to engage in the pursuit of the freedom of Marissa Alexander. Send us an email. Just check out the Twitter hashtag 31 for Marissa. All the details um, are right there. We wanted an hour to talk. Jeff, we've got a whole bunch of young brothers, actually high school brothers, who want to be part of this conversation. So I'm definitely going to uh, come back to you and ask you to read that conversation again. But we're going to close it down. Jeff, Donnell, Kai, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.